Welcome to the Kelly Cardenas podcast, where ev- uh, attitude is everything. Today, we're joined by father, husband, adventure freak, thrill seeker, man's man, and pastor, <laughs> Mr. Jason Graves. Welcome to the show, buddy. Thanks, man. That was a mouthful. <laughs> I had to write it down because otherwise, that's that's so much. Yep. Well, I want to thank you so much for being on the uh, podcast. I think one of the biggest uh, reasons why I wanted to be able to have you on is because, like, you're a real guy. Um, obviously, I mean, you're a pastor in our in our uh, community. Um, you're a leader that way, but you're a real guy talking about real things, and you'll you'll own times when you mess it up. Oh, yeah. Uh, which I think is awesome. So. Uh, I've just, I've been so uh, blown away by it. I remember your one, one of the stories that you had where you were driving and uh, you weren't so nice <laughs> to the person behind you. And then they pulled into the, uh, <laughs> they pulled in right next to you. You want to tell them that, that one? That so? was LA, man. Everything okay. goes in LA. So yeah, I was raised in LA and uh, I was driving all the way to church and somebody was turning right at a red light in front of me. And you know, man, if you, if you're going to turn right on a red, just get up there and make sure there's no one there and go. And the person was just sitting there, sitting there and wasted a full eight to 12 seconds of my life. So I was, <laughs> I was, I don't have a lot of patience. So I was sitting there just steaming and mad. So I like laid into the horn. I'm like, go, oh, you know, and then this was like two miles away from church. And as we're driving close to the church, I'm like still behind them. And I'm realizing, oh, shoot, we might be going to the same place. And in the end, we pull into the parking lot, like right next to each other. And so they're like, oh, the pastor was the jerk behind me and like honking the horn. Like, that pretty much sums up my life. (laughs) (laughs) So I know we have what we have in common uh, is, number one, we're really handsome. Uh, So that's the that that was the first thing. And Oakland Raider fans. Those are the two things we have in common. Let's have a moment of silence. We really need Jesus up in this room with a, with a Raider fan here. But I, I, you are an avid Raider fan. But we grew, we grew up in the Central Coast around the same time, yep. um, which is great. So musically, uh, musically wise, we were just talking about NWA, which yep. is awesome to talk with my pastor about NWA. <laughs> I got to tell you. And I recently, if you're, if you're watching here from our community, I just asked him if he listened to the Ghetto Boys. And he was like, oh, yeah, I know who they are. He actually told me he was listening to them on the way here. I'm joking nope. with you. And I know. I know you don't anymore. I understand. So growing up on the West Coast, take us through the, uh, like, we know who Jason is. I mean, you're like, we know who Jason Graves is. Take us back to little Jason uh, when you were growing up. Um, Who was that guy? I actually almost had kind of uh, uh, two parts of my childhood in that I was born and raised in Van Nuys, California, which is like the armpit of Los Angeles. It's, (laughs) It's just north of like Hollywood and all the cool places in L.A., but um, so you get all the traffic and the smog, but without any of the cool stuff. And um, so I was raised there, um, spent five years in a little town called Simi Valley. I don't know if you've ever heard of that. Of course. Right. So Moore Park, baby. Yeah. So cool. back in the day, that was like Mayberry. And so I was like, I started off in LA as a little kid. Then when I was five to 11 years old, lived in Simi Valley, which was like beautiful suburb, nice, you know, and then um went through like this family crisis thing. It's kind of a long story, but ended up moving back in sixth grade to like a really gnarly area, like got beat up all the time, got right inserted into gang life. I wasn't in any gangs, but like I was inserted. So I went from like Mayberry to like hiding um, knives and like Chains, because in the 80s, a chain was a weapon for movies, <laughs> <laughs> like nunchucks or something. D- double Dragon? <laughs> yeah. Did you play Double Dragon back in the day? Right. Yeah. So okay. I used to hide like knives and chains literally in the bushes on the way home from school, because that way if kids chased me, I could be like, go grab my knife. And you know. Did you ever have to, I mean, because I always thought like I had a knife when I was a kid. Mm-hmm. I mean, obviously, you know, you have them, whatever it is, but- it's a different, it's one thing to have a knife and it's a different thing to <laughs> Did I stab actually anyone? use it. Did you ever stab anyone? Did you come close? <laughs> I never. Uh, did you wield? I, I did you did, wield I it? I did. I did once. How, show how did you wield it? Like this? Or did you do it like this? <laughs> it was like a little. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I was like, is that a nail file? Did, did um, you, yeah, did, no, no. I just showed it to a kid. Okay. And dumb enough, I did it in class. And I thought he was like this tough guy. 
and he was threatening me. I pulled out the knife. He goes, teacher. And like he, they called me. So they just kicked me out of school and took my knife away. Kicked you out of school, like for the rest uh, of the year. How long? A couple days. A couple days. Yeah. So you got street cred at that time. Did, did your game <laughs> step up at that time? Did, did ladies start saying like, yo, that's Jason. You know, he, you better, you know, he, he'll protect you. I'm going through in my head the other things that would give me more street cred <laughs> than that. But sure. <laughs> <laughs> so where was this uh, when you went when you got uh, back to the kind of rough neighborhood where was that at you it was in the city of Van Nuys but it was okay. literally on the corner of, of Van Nuys and, and basically Sherman Way which I don't know what a good equivalent would be but it was a really um, strong yeah I was a minority for sure in my okay. schools growing up um, and it, yeah I got beat up a lot really I, I deserved some of it but you know got bike stolen got jumped got my skateboard stolen um and then had some close calls where I saw some gnarly stuff go down, but I wasn't involved in it. You know, my wife's, uh, my wife, my sister's boyfriend got shot right in front of her. Uh, yep. In a club back in the day, Van Nuys was, was pretty gnarly, like bunch of gangs, bunch of bad stuff going down. So yeah, that was, that was like, I went from Mayberry to that and it was a pretty rough time. So this was sixth grade when you got to back to Van Nuys. Yeah, that, I mean, that was sixth okay. grade up and through like early high school. So when did you, we talked about Ventura, like yep. you were in Ventura for a little I bit. I didn't grow up in Ventura. I moved to Ventura. Um, my wife and I moved there after I graduated from college. Oh, really? Yeah, I didn't okay. grow up in Ventura. I wish I grew up in Ventura. Where'd you, where'd you go to high school? I went to two years to a school called Birmingham High School. Okay. And the best way for anybody who would know to picture it, it was exactly like the high school from the movie Karate Kid yes. from the 80s. It was like half really rich kids from Encino uh -huh. and then half of the kids from Reseda and Van Nuys. Reseda and Van Nuys touched each other. They were right next to each other. So that was exactly like my up upbringing. Okay, so with the Karate Kid, did you wear the headband back in the day? No, no, symbols? I wasn't into karate. It's just like there was the have and the have nots at the school. It was like the poor kids who were like in the gang and the okay. multicultural area. And then it was this, like the really wealthy kids whose parents were attorneys and they lived up above Ventura Boulevard in the hills where whatever, what was the girl from? I can't remember. Whatever, right. you know what I'm talking about. Where the girl lived yeah, and he goes yeah, to yeah. meet the parent. Yeah. It's like that was a lot of my life, yeah. You just sidestepped something, though. You were saying that, I said, did you wear the Daniel Sun thing? And you were like, I'm not in karate. I wasn't in karate at the time, but that was the style. Did yeah, you, yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, no, I had karate did, slippers. Did you wear the <laughs> shirt that was cut open on the sides no, all the way down? I was into Michael Jackson, dude. That, me too! Yes, I was into Michael Jackson. So I was, I was like in breakdancing and that kind of stuff. Okay, what was yeah. your breakdancing name? Pinky. <laughs> 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 no, no, hold this, dude. I had, I, <laughs> what? I had a, I, you would have loved this. Pinky. I had a pink sweatsuit with, with a pink sleeveless shirt. And the, the back had a uh, pinky and old English letters. Remember old English, Yes, right? of course. Which right when you think like, okay, the front though was a giant Michael Jackson, like iron on patch. Yes. And I had pink covers with pink fat laces. Where yeah. did you get pinky? Because you were white and you were a break dancer? Is that why? I can't remember. I honestly don't remember why I got that. Really? Yeah. What was your signature move? Because I was a break dancer too. My I was pretty good at hand spinning. Hand spinning? Like, yeah, just one hand. And then just you go? get yourself going. Okay. And go. Yeah, I love Did you have that. windmills? No. You didn't have windmills? Like three. Could you get. <laughs> I got like two and a half, three, <laughs> and then I just lost. <laughs> could you Could you swipe? You remember swiping? Oh, yeah, I could yeah, still you swipe. You could swipe? I you could still swipe? I could do it on the table. Okay, I'm going to challenge you. I want to see this at church. Swiping what? is the only thing I have left okay. in the arsenal and a really bad up rock. Remember what oh, you do before you yeah. go down? Yeah, it's not good. But I can swipe for days. I still do. Did you have popping? Did you have like your, you know, did you have your isolations and stuff? Yeah. You were, you were pretty good? Yeah, I was okay. When you were, did you battle a lot? I taught kids mostly. Like I taught kids in my neighborhood for really? money. Yeah, for okay. money. Um, and, you know, a little bit of battling. I mean, that was, I wasn't that good, dude. <laughs> it was it was be it was better back in the day because it was like you wouldn't really fight. You would be like, no, oh, I yeah, challenge yeah. you to a breakdance battle. Yeah. And then if you got beat, you would it was like worse than getting whooped. <laughs> back you know then, I mean? if you would have asked me, I'd have been like, heck yeah. You know, now looking back, I was like, no, nah, you were just a like uncoordinated <laughs> white kid who got stuck in a bad part of town. <laughs> <laughs> so you're 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 in high school because we're right around the same time. So we're breakdancing yeah. at the same time. Yeah. Michael Jackson. Okay, Michael Jackson, all time favorite album. I, I just go basic. It's thriller for me. Okay. Yeah, I got it for Christmas got when it. I was like in junior high. And that. PYT. Yes. Human nature. Yeah. Okay. Which Michael Jackson jacket did you have? Um, I had a black version of the red zipper jacket. 
Ah, you know, like the fake yeah. leather. We didn't yeah. have a lot of money, so I don't know where my parents got it. I got it for Christmas. I but. don't think there was a real leather one except for Michael, because back in yeah, that yeah, day, yeah. I mean, all of us were yeah. sporting pleather. But it was that red with all the zippers on it, yeah. leather, but mine was black, and that, I don't know why. That was the bag. I, I had a glove, too, dude. You did? I did. Dude, I still have the <laughs> Michael Jackson doll. <laughs> oh, yeah. Like the Michael Jackson, almost like a Barbie doll, but it's yeah. Michael Jackson. Yeah. And I had the Thriller, the Thriller jacket, and it was satin. My brother got the black one, just like yours. Okay. And he wore it one day. First day of school, he wore it. And these guys wanted to beat him up because he was wearing it. And he was like, I'm never wearing this thing again. Yeah. Been a Michael Jackson fan forever. I, yeah, I, for sure. I, I love you even more, man. You, you, I don't know if you heard the story. The one time I got punched out in class at that school where I used to hide the knives and chains, there's a tall, skinny kid named Andre. Andre liked Prince. And he wore the shirts with the flower. No. Not Prince. This kid wore, in sixth grade, no. the big pirate the puppy shirt, shirt. Right? And I had my Michael Jackson thing. So, like, we were arguing about it in class one day. And he just, boom, socks me right in front of the teacher. I'm like, you can't punch somebody in class. I didn't know that. And it's hard to win a fight that you don't know you're in. And uh, he literally just socked me right in class over the battle of Michael Jackson versus Prince. Clearly, he was wrong, objectively. Of course. Philosophically. But of he course. won the fight. <laughs> I've never heard of a fight about Michael and Prince, but there should be more of them. <laughs> <laughs> I think they should ask the UFC. <laughs> they should ask, and you have to choose a side. Not the blue corner, the red corner, the purple corner. <laughs> <laughs> What's the... I have no idea. I, have, I don't even know. But it, it's uh, incredible because we grew up in that area, yeah, right, in the yeah. Central Coast, and he was right there. Yeah. And I remember him phantomly going to be at a concert, and we'd wait for hours, and then he'd never show up. Oh, um, I knew where he lived. We drove by his house and oh, stuff. Oh, yeah. yeah. It was like 15 minutes from my house. Yeah. People were like, oh, did you hang out there? I was like, no, not as a oh, child. Oh, you're talking about the big mansion. Yeah. Uh, no, no, no. You were Never Encino. Land. Yeah, Encino. He yeah. had a house in Encino. You were like Joe Jackson. You know what I mean? Joe Jackson time. <laughs> yeah. I'm talking Neverland. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah. I'm talking never go. Creepy, don't never, go this <laughs> time. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, never, yeah. ever go there. Yeah. So you're in you're in high school. You just get punched out uh, for uh, liking <laughs> Michael Jackson because the, the Prince fan. Um, that, was, that was when I was younger, but okay. nonetheless. Yeah, yeah. All right. So you're in high school. Where do you go to college? Um, I went to a really small Christian college called Life Pacific, and it's in San Dimas, Bill and Ted's Eklund. Yes. This is all 80s We're stuff. the 10 and 210 Any, Anyone younger is watching is like, where does all this references? Raging Waters, Raging baby. Waters, yep. I went to school like a couple miles from Raging Waters. Um, nothing exciting about it, but it was the place where I, I got my theological degree. Okay. So you grew up as a pastor's kid, but you're hiding chains and, and wielding knives. I'm listening to NWA. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so how did... How, Hold on, go, I gotta go. go. Get it. I, I was, if you would have known me, bro, I was super straight-laced, though. I, to this day, have never been drunk in my entire life, which is... Give me five on that one. Yeah, people are like... And it wasn't because I was, like, necessarily trying to be so good. Like, I saw kids who were drunk, and it scared me. And so I'm like, I don't want to do that. Never did drugs, like... Never really, I got in a lot of trouble, but for like mild stuff, like breaking into schools or punching a girl in class. Or <laughs> like just, yeah, that's another story. I got a lot of punching Some, people stories or I, getting Turner. punched. Turner, yeah. Yeah, well, <laughs> dude, what are you, t I was in hey, seventh grade. I didn't bring hold up on, that you punched on. a girl, hold man. Now I, got, you now know I do I mean? have to tell it. Okay. I yeah. come out of class seventh grade. This girl grabs me and starts like scratching me. Never met her, didn't know why. On your face? So I put her in a headlock. Her earring got caught in my sweater. I like pushed her off. It ripped her earring oh. out. It was gnarly. And her boyfriend was like the big scary kid who had a mustache in junior high. Oh. Like he drove himself to junior high. <laughs> you know, he's like fourth time to, in seventh grade. Um, but anyway, so I didn't go like looking around to beat up girls. But um, but the, the thing, like I, I was still like really straight laced. Like I listened to NWA, but I probably like never said the F word. Because okay. my parents were pastors yeah. and they, yeah, I would get crushed for it. That makes sense. So yeah, I didn't do like, never did drugs, didn't like gnarly stuff, but I like, I no, no, I, <laughs> hey, I'm feeling you. I'm feeling you. I actually, it's funny that you say it. I don't, I don't actually, uh, t I tell very, very few people about it because, uh, but I've never had a drink in my life. Wow. I've never had any drugs before ever anything. And the reason why I don't is because a lot of times people will think that I'm going to judge them or pass judgment. On sure. Them. Yeah. Let's talk about that. Like we're going to fast forward. Just to be forward. clear, I mean, I came to you wearing a Virgin Brewing hat. There so we go. I, I, I drink beer and yeah, wine, yeah, yeah. but I just don't ever get drunk. So let's, I'm gonna, I'm, I'm gonna, uh, we're going to come back to your stories of, uh, you know, um, ah. prints and things <laughs> like that. But I want to go into, like, how is it being, I mean, being a pastor, 
Um, if you say that you're a pastor to someone, they instantly drop down, start praying and tell you like, God be with you. Um, how is that for you as a person? Cause you're Jason mm -hmm. and then, but you're pastor Jason to some people. How do you navigate those things? You mean like how do people respond to me if they find out I'm a pastor? Yeah. Like what I was saying, I don't tell people that I don't drink sure. because they're like, oh man, I don't drink either except for in the morning, noon and night. And when I'm <laughs> yeah, 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 by yeah. myself or with people. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Honestly, it's probably pretty similar. And because of that, I don't mention, like if I'm on a flight, and people are like, what do you do for a living? I'm like, um, I help run a nonprofit. Okay. It's true. I'm yeah. not lying. Um, churches are nonprofit organizations. Um, I usually, unless pressed, you know, or if I feel like there's a reason to bring it up. Because I like, you know, you're surfing. And what do, what do guys often ask the first question? What do you what do? Do you do? Yeah. 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 So once I do, you notice like, yeah, people respond probably much like saying I'm a vegan or I'm you know, whatever. <clears throat> so I usually avoid it a little bit, but then what I try to do, like, to be honest is, um, to put people at ease is just try to say something inappropriate. <laughs> or just like, show... I, like I beat up a woman. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm a pastor, but I also, <laughs> uh, no, you know, usually I, telling them I'm the Oakland Raiders fan does yeah, the job, right? Yes. yes like that, you can't be a pastor and a Raiders fan. Yeah. <laughs> No, you know, like, but I usually, yeah, try to just say something because people, you know, we judge people very quickly, don't we? When we, of course, based off of what their career or what their hair looks like or what their whatever, you know, like people must come up to you all the time and offer you pot. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I get asked in, in the and grocery see, stores. You want to go play Frisbee golf with me, bro? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I had one person i was with my daughter and she's in like a stroller and the guy whirls up on me in the grocery store he's like yo you got the good stuff and i was like yeah cucumbers yeah, like yeah, that's what I got. you know what i mean i know it sucks. You, know you got the good stuff <laughs> um, and i've had it happen at gas stations for sure i mean all around the place so for sure okay so both i mean there's there's two sides to the story there's almost a, this little uh, fork in the road where a pastor's kid Either like I always wanted to hang out with the pastor's daughter because you know she was wild and <laughs> out. You know what I'm saying? Like yeah. you were gonna have a good time. We were yeah. in. Yes, let's go. And so the pastor's that was kid, my sister okay. by the way for a while. So yeah. maybe I dated her. Um, <laughs> I'm just joking. <laughs> we could be brothers. Um, so <laughs> I'm joking. I love my wife a lot. Um, it, there's this road, and then there's. I mean, you went down you know, you went a similar way. What was the, like, where was that influence and what made you want to move that way? You mean? And not away toward, from it. Toward going into like being a pastor. Yeah. I mean, stuff. going down that way because, you know, obviously probably the ghetto boys probably wanted you to go on tour with them. And, <laughs> yeah. You know, yeah. you were thinking. For like, my break dancing moves. Yeah, of I could course. Be like the background dancer. Yeah, Pinky. You know, I've always personally had um, this sense that my life was not really mine to determine what I was to do with it. I don't okay. know if that makes yeah. sense. Yeah, yeah. Um, I knew from a very young age I didn't want to exist to just make money or to be, you know, growing up in LA, I didn't want to feel like I was to be famous or try and do anything like that. that but that I, I sensed that my job was to find out, and my parents kind of drilled this into me, God has a plan for your life. You don't want to miss out on it. So you want to find out what he wants for you more than just determining it yourself. Okay. If that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. And so it's very different for everybody, How you know, based on what you believe about God or if there's a God. But for me, I was raised in a home where I believed there was a God. Okay. Therefore, I believed that I was, in essence, accountable to him for everything in my life, except for my music selection <laughs> and my football. <laughs> no. And so what happened is, like, like I told you, there were... I, there were things that I was around as a kid because of where I lived and what, where I was raised. And I'm really grateful for that. Yeah. But you would have probably thought I was kind of like a, like a square nerd growing up because I, 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 I was around stuff, but like I had my own kind of life. Like I wouldn't steal things, you know, I didn't, I didn't get in fights with people unless I was defending myself. <laughs> you know, I wasn't, I don't want to like paint the picture that I was out there like more, more yeah, rough yeah, and yeah. crazy than I was. Mostly the things that I got in trouble for were adventure things. Okay. Like I broke into my school and like rappelled down to the top. Didn't really steal anything or thing. I just wanted to you do just it wanted just to, to be it. fun. Yeah. But then as I got older, honestly, I, um, I had this really strong sense, um, that it, it was, it was actually to help little kids. So when I was 11 years old, my dad, um, who was a pastor, got involved in an, an extramarital affair with a lady in our mm. church. 
And it just, as you can imagine, I won't go through the whole story, but it wrecked our whole family, right? In fact, that's why, by the way, I moved from Simi Valley Mayberry back to L.A., Okay. Because my dad was a pastor in this little church. Oh. So my world got turned upside yeah, down, yeah, right? Yeah. So as I grew up, when I was in high school, I was going to church and I would volunteer with like the kids, you know, like fifth and sixth grade kids. Yeah. Cause that was the age where I went through this horrible crisis. And so part of what kind of drew me into ministry is I was just volunteering with kids and trying to help these kids who are fifth and sixth grade, who maybe they were parents were going through divorce or you know, some, something was going on in their life. And that for me, I realized very quickly being raised in LA area, you see a lot of people with a lot of affluence. And a lot of times I noticed they weren't necessarily the most centered or happy people with their lives. And then I would see sometimes people who were making a difference with their life and someone else's like, they weren't living for what can I get, but how can I help other people? And they seem to be so fulfilled. And so I think that helped inform for me as I grew up as well as this sense that there's a God, and I think what he wants me to do is be a pastor, which, you know, I don't know how important or relevant that would be to yeah. you, but that, that always was like hanging around my life as well. Well, you're known, I mean, if you, if you speak your name, you speak your name in our community, you speak your name around in the, in, in the community uh, in, in where, you, where you live, people always talk about men. Like, it always comes up. Like, I remember one of the first times I was at a uh, football practice, and one of the guys asked me, he's like, have you ever heard of Jason Graves? And he didn't tell me about the church. He didn't tell me about any of those things. He was like, yeah, we go on this camping trip, and <laughs> you barely survive. And <laughs> it's like seven days, and, you know, he makes you, uh, you know, not eat, and, you know, <laughs> and, and, burns, and burns your skin the whole time. And <laughs> That's a little exaggerating. I'm joking. But, yeah, but yeah. he told me about this adventure, and he's like, yeah, you should go. And I was like, no. <laughs> yeah. um, but I, I, I do want to go on it. What got you into doing that, like, when I said man's man, mm -hmm. it is like you want to jump off stuff, repel yeah. in your high school. Most people would just want to steal a test. Yeah. You know, so where, where did that come um, from? I mean, I grew up, I have two brothers and we're all three really close in age. Okay. And my dad, you know, he grew up as a California guy surfing and he would just take us, you know, jumping off of rock cliffs into like a pond or a pool or something like, but it was a, it was a, the yin to the yang because I was raised in LA. So city mm -hmm. bus, like really confined, no nature around. I probably didn't see a horse till I was like 10 years old, you know? And then what happened is as I grew older, I started craving adventure and risks and like, let's see, you know? So at first that was breaking into schools and lowering each other down with ropes <laughs> to the gym ceiling and just stupid stuff like that. Um, and then, but what, it really wasn't so much about adventure. You, you know, the reason why I'm probably known um, in as a pastor is like the whole man's man thing is it's the same thing that I told you about the kids. So for years when I became a pastor and I, I um, had the, the privilege of helping start a church and kind of forming what that church would look like, I had always put all of our resources toward kids, right? I want to help these kids because yeah. they're coming from like um, rough home lives. When they get to our church, I want them to have the best hour of their week. And then after like being a pastor for 15 years, I realized if you send a kid home to a place where his dad is, you know, at best <laughs> neglecting them, overwork, you know, it's very expensive where, where you and I live here. And so dads a lot of time are putting in tons of hours and they're, you know, at best, oftentimes though, they're, they're addicted, they're, you know, their marriage is a wreck, blah, blah, blah. And what I realized is if I want to help kids, I have to get to their dads. Wow. That's what I realized because I know this... I hope this doesn't come off as like sexist or misogynistic, but oftentimes as go, goes a man, goes a household and a community even really, right? And we know this by looking at fatherless sectors of, of the, the world and places where you find men who are, for whatever reason, less present or, you know, less equipped to help kids. So that became my drive, like, and, and by the way, it was supernatural because you know me, like I love doing just all kinds of sports. I suck at basketball. I suck at golf. I would argue that golf isn't even a sport, but, um, <laughs> <laughs> but everything else I'm game for it. Like I just love it. I think it's being raised with two brothers really close in age. We're always making fun of each other and competing for stuff. So it came natural to me. How many years are there between you and your brothers? 
Uh, I have one that's two years older and one that's three years older. Okay, so you guys are tight. But to be clear, from about 15 years old and on, I could kick both of their butts. And you're the youngest? I'm the baby. You're the baby, and you were whoop. You it didn't tail. happen until when, and when I was 15, one of my, my youth pastors <laughs> taught me how to fight my brother because he was a cop slash pastor, which is a great mix. And he like gave me some good advice. He's like, don't stand out there and stick with your brother. He's taller. He's more coordinated. He's faster. But I was a little chubby. So he's like, just run in there, rush him, throw him on the ground, then beat him up. Went home, tried it that day. From that day forward, I you never tried lost it? to fight my brother. You tried it? You oh, just went he, home? We, we, my youth pastor pulled up to the, he, we went to lunch. He Put, dropped me off front of my house. My brother was on the front lawn. I went straight to him and picked a fight to try it. But we fought every day anyway, so it didn't okay. matter. Yeah, Love each other now. Yeah. Fought every day growing up. Really? Yeah. Me and my brother fought too, and then I, I got whooped. The last, I remember the last time getting whooped, he was on top of me <laughs> whooping me. And I was like, uh, if we join forces, we could... <laughs> 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 we could con- we could conquer things. No. So <laughs> let's go back to Bill and Ted's adventure. Uh, you're in, in San Dimas. You're listening to NWA. Going to <laughs> go, going to uh, uh, Life Pacific. Bo- yeah, Life was, Pacific. That's okay. where I got my college. Degree. So you're going there. You're listening to NWA. You've got that in the car. But when you pull up to the sanctuary, you turn on like Hillsong or yep. you know some praise music. <laughs> I love this because my wife gets on me. I, I literally listen to two things, Jason. One is gangster rap. Like, you know, like one of my favorites of NWA is If It Ain't Rough, It Ain't Me. That's my, one of my favorite songs. So I'm listening to that or I'm listening to Contemporary Christian. And okay. she's like, what is wrong? Like, you're, it's not like a middle ground. It's either jumping off a cliff or, you know, on the, on the side. So college time, um, are you pretty clear on, you know, is this, is this man's part starting to take, uh, uh, you know, take, I, I, no, I mean, I wouldn't even say it's intentional in the sense I want to be a manly man. It's yeah. just like, you know, I just was raised with brothers just and we were stuff. always hurting each other and yeah. goofing off and going on adventures. And so what, that part wasn't intentional necessarily. You would only go to that college if you were going to be a pastor. It's a pretty okay. small college. Like yeah. it wasn't like just a a liberal arts college or a Christian college, you went there to study the Bible, the Bible. to okay. become a pastor, et cetera. I mean, I was studying Greek and Hebrew and boring stuff like that. So what was the, what was the thing that you were like, uh, maybe growing up as a pastor's kid, you hear it and you were confused by it and you were like, I don't really, I mean. In church, you mean? No, either in church or in the Bible, you're yeah. reading it and you're like, yeah, 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 cool, cool, cool. And then you read that one verse and you, I, I, for there's, me. Dude, there's still stuff. There. And I write a question mark. Yeah. And I write a question mark and then I'm like, I'm good with you, God. I understand who you are, but I don't know about that one. Yeah. And they keep getting answered. One just got answered the other day. What are some of those things for you? Um, they, they are not so much like, is there a God? There's been too much that's happened in of my course. life. Like, you know, and I understand how some people could argue you know, against that. But for me personally, there's just been way too much stuff that I can't like gnarly God stuff. That's like, it can't possibly have happened other than the fact that there was God. Um, but when I see kids suffering, mm. um, when, uh, when I hear, you know, natural disasters, things like that, it's like, okay, God, I know that we live in a broken world where I know evil exists because nine 11, because the Holocaust, because you know, we see it, but I also believe that God has the ability to affect history and, and authority and governments and all that kind of stuff. But he's chosen to, for some reason, like stay back on certain things. Yeah. And so that's where most of my questions lie. Like, uh, you know, as a, as a pastor, as a Christian, I believe in the authority of the Bible. And what I mean is like, if my experiences don't line up with what the Bible teaches, I go with the Bible. And the reason is, is because I know my experiences are very subjective. The same way that 50 years ago, doctors were recommending smoking as a way to relax, right? <laughs> so human wisdom only goes so far. And you maybe have heard me say this before, but there are these big questions that we all have about God and doubts that we have. Every one of us. If you don't, then you're just ignorant. <laughs> you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. you're lying to yourself. But what I do is um, instead of like stacking up, well, these are the things that I believe and these are the things that I doubt. Um, I I think of it, there's a Bible verse that says that God's ways and his thoughts are higher than ours. Okay. And so the analogy that I've made oftentimes is with the things I don't understand, I I think of it more in terms of the nature of who, who God is and I am. So we, I have a dog, a golden retriever who loves to drink out of the toilet bowl, right? And to drink out of the toilet bowl makes sense for her. It's head height, it's cool water. Now I can sit down with her and try to explain to her about bacteria and germs and how that's gross. And she'd be like, "Mm -hmm." 
and then go back and drink out of the toilet bowl. Why? Because she doesn't have the cognitive ability that I have, right? So if dogs are down here and I'm up here as a human, if there is a God, is it possible that his wisdom is higher, right? If there is a God, shouldn't he be maybe smarter than a person? So the questions that I have, like, I don't doubt that he knows the reasons why and the right answers. I just have to chalk that up to, I don't know those things yet. You know, maybe one day for me, I believe that in heaven, I'm going to see God and get to ask him some of these questions. But for all of these big doubts that all of us have, we all have them. I chalk them up to, well, if my dog can't understand some things about my life, maybe there are some things about why God does what he does globally that I just won't understand. If that's absolutely clear, you know, absolutely. it's a simplification of no. a lot more complex things, but that's kind of how I view it. But it, it, it's amazing to think about. It. I never thought about it that way as far as the, uh, like you said, the dog and then the, the person and then uh, going on that way. That's incredible. So, <clears throat> um, you got, you have an incredible family. Um, I've, I've got a chance. Your wife is involved with the church. You guys have uh, been able to do, you know, been able to see you guys and things like that. How'd you meet your wife? Did you meet her in college? I met her at that college. You met her at that college. Yep. Okay. Take me through this because you're, you're going to school to be a pastor. I mean, y- you guys are good looking people. Your wife is a beautiful woman. You're obviously attracted to your wife. You're listening to NWA. Um, so is... <laughs> Probably, to be honest, more Public Enemy than okay. WA, but I did listen to WA. Okay, yeah, yeah, Public yeah. Enemy, yeah, first yeah. concert I ever went yeah. to, Public yeah, Enemy. Yeah, but like 67% less profanity and less shooting of cops. Of course, and they were, <laughs> 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 they, they were publicly conscious too. Yes. I loved it because at the, at the concert, this is my first one, I'm in Memphis at a, like a college bar, and Chuck D hands me the mic during Fight the Power. Shut the front door. And he hands me the mic, and I'm like, Fight the power? <laughs> <laughs> it, was, it was one of my favorites. So you meet her at college. I met her How'd college. you meet her? Did you have game or did she have game? So, so um, I had game, and I'll tell you why I say Uh-oh. that. And Uh-oh. Not, not because I think I'm like, so, so like. Uh, well, you beat, so up, you beat up here's your how I brothers. Found her. <laughs> there we go. How I found out about her was one of my lifelong best friends was trying to pick up on her. And we both went to the same school, but um, for reasons aren't worth going into. I had never seen her yet on the campus. Okay. But uh, several of my friends were like, it was a small school. So if there's a cute girl that shows up, it's like <clears throat> ants on candy, right? Oh, yeah. So um, I had heard about this girl, but um, I, you know, most of the girls <laughs> from that school came from like, for some reason, the, the Pacific Northwest. So they had like Birkenstocks, Birkenstocks. before Birkenstocks oh. were cool. Harry legs. Birth control. That's yes, birth control. exactly. <laughs> yes. And so, and they were all there on the hunt for men. Life, we called it life bridal college <laughs> instead of Bible college, a ring by spring or your money back. And, um, but so this cute girl shows up from Central Valley actually. And so the word gets out. So the first time I actually met her. Central Valley, like Fresno? Uh, south of there, Visalia. I know Visalia. Yeah. Okay. All so right. that's Tulare County. Represent. My wife was runner-up Miss Tulare County. She wow. couldn't even win Miss Tulare <laughs> County. <laughs> we love you. We love you. We love you. We love you. We think you're beautiful. Go she ahead. She was prettier than the okay. one who won, but the one who won had was great art, art artistic skills. So anyways, um, so I had to like go behind my friend's back to meet her because he was telling me we were co-workers together. And he's like, oh, this girl, Corey. Did that. Was he a pastor too? Uh, he became a pastor. He we did? were both in college and we were janitors. I would, if you would have been my friend, I would have renounced God. If you would have went behind my back and then stole my lady. He didn't. Well, here's the thing, dude. I could <laughs> tell by what he was telling me that she wasn't into it ah. for like a month. He's like, oh, I'm trying this. I showed up with flowers at her work and all this stuff. And I'm like, dude, if she hasn't said yes, she's, she's, she's not, not she's not down okay, here. Right. <laughs> yeah. But I didn't want to tell him that at least not until I found out if she liked me back. So I went and met her. I actually ended up, took, took her on a date. And you were doing this and your buddy didn't know. There wasn't any reason to tell yes. him until, until yes. I knew. Were you guys like down like that? Were you guys like boys? Oh, dude. Our, you guys were Our close. dads were friends before we were born. This was your boy. He would be like a cousin almost. So your boy, what would you be doing? You'd be playing some Tecmo oh, Bowl and be like, good. yo, I'm going to I'm gonna step off for a second. Let me go get some, uh, let me go get some in and out right off of Rancho Conejo real quick. And, uh, and, and I'll be right back. By the way, I, I'm going after your lady. By the way, I stole your girl. <laughs> <laughs> she they, they hadn't even been on a date so okay, if they had right. it would have been different okay. but um the reason i say i got game is the day that i asked her out for the first time i actually pulled her out of class what like college class i was at a, um i i was were like, you in the class no 
No. You rolled up in class it and was, was like, yo, there you're was mine, like a let's little, roll. There was a little like window you no. know, in the door. I swear to you. Because I told myself this. Before, it's, before like, it's college, not high school. Before school's out today, I'm going to ask this girl on a date. And so I tried to go find her. I couldn't find her. Class had already started. I had to leave to go back to work. So I'm like, I told myself. So I go to the front door of the class. It's like 10 minutes into class. I knock on the door. There's like 25, 30 students in, in the class. The professor looks over and I'm like, you know, I, I signal to her with my finger through the window and call her out. She's like, what, me? I'd only met her for the first time like two days before. Pulled her out, asked her to lunch. She said yes. I'm like, yeah, doesn't surprise me. <laughs> that's gang. I that is gang. I, that's like that is most, gang. That's what I'm most proud of of everything in life that like I had the guts to do that. <laughs> wow. And it paid off. We got four kids. Been that's married for no, 24 years. Oh my gosh. So married 24 years. What's the secret to staying married 24 years? Don't make eye contact. <laughs> 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 okay, so gr- when you guys had kids right off the bat, did you guys have bedtimes for the kids? Very early. Very yeah. early. Somebody gave us the advice, put your kids to bed at like seven. Who was this? I don't remember, but we did it all through time. Okay, we, why we did they tell you that? So that you can have mom and dad time. Okay, this, w- this, <laughs> this I don't know if there's the same dude. Probably is. <laughs> Do you know uh, uh, Kent Muncie? Uh Phil Muncy related Kent, to Phil uh, Yeah, Kent. Yeah, I and, know who they are. But Kent I don't know. and Allie Muncy. They're yeah. pastors in, uh, yep. in Chicago. They've got to be the same Muncy's, yeah. So you're going to love this. I got a chance to uh, to speak at the church. I got to come and uh, do a sermon one time. And I, it was, it's been a... Uh, it was a dream of mine. Yeah. And, you know, it's one of those things because I speak in my industry, but I wanted to speak outside the industry. And particularly, I wanted to be able to deliver a sermon. And I got the chance to do it for the first time in Chicago. Okay. So I was hanging out with the pastor. Two parts of this story. First part is we're hanging out with the, him, and him and I, all three of us, we'd be hanging. We know, like NWA and yeah. Prince, and he probably didn't get beat up because of Michael Jackson, but um, he got all those things. Well, we, uh, we were looking at some real estate, and he stands up on this thing, and he taps his foot to see if it's hollow. And I was like, what's he doing? He stamped his foot, and I was like, I'm seeing if it's hollow. And then he's like, Randy Watson, everybody. Randy Watson. <laughs> and I was like, I love you. You know what I mean? Because who knows about sexual yeah, chocolate? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So he's like, I've always wanted to, as a pastor, to end my sermon with sexual chocolate, and I'm out. And so... <laughs> that would be your last Sunday, probably. <laughs> <laughs> so so we, uh, that's, this is the day before we go in. We go to the church. We're doing it. Th- we, uh, we go in to do some counseling and a little, you know, pre-game. Pre-briefing, yeah. Pre-game. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we're sitting there, and he's telling a story similar to you. He's like, uh, we, uh, you know, we're parenting all this stuff. And he's like, we put our kids to bed at 7. And, I was, and then he went on with the story. And I was like, wait, just stop. Wait, why? <laughs> and he was like, I said, tell me how, because my kids ain't going to bed at that time. He's like, me and my wife agreed very early yep. that it would be better to fight our kids to go to bed early than for them to wake up to their step parents. Mm, that's good, dude. And I just stopped. That's, and I was like, oh! dude, that's good. <laughs> right? That's and I, good. I was like, oh. Yeah. So then I did the sermon, got uh, done, did an altar call. There was 35 people gave their heart to the Lord. I'm, I'm going to use that from now, by the way. Yes. 35, 35 people. Wow. 35 people gave their heart to the Lord. And when I did the prayer over them, I said, amen. And then I said, sexual chocolate, I'm out, and dropped the mic no, and didn't. walked off. Oh, yes. my God. Have never got asked back to that <laughs> church <No>. ever. <laughs> Are you serious? <laughs> and the, the pastor oh, was looking, and oh. I could see it, and everyone just stopped. And it was just like the movie. And my wife was like, what's wrong with you? And then the, the, I'm sure that you have an assistant at the church. His assistant scurried out, grabbed the microphone, and just scurried to the back of the stage. And I just literally dropped the mic and just whoa, sexual chocolate in him. And so... Every time that I speak, and I've got a chance, uh, just recently, my <laughs> biggest uh, my biggest one, um, what was it, uh, about 35, I think 3,500. Wow. And I sexual chocolated them too. Um, it's, it's, Let me make a note to okay. tell my assistant, Kelly never- Yeah, exactly. Uh, okay, so that, that was my angle here, man, but, I, I, but, but it was- <laughs> That's and, ballsy, bro. That and, is ballsy. And it was before it, before it got popular, people oh. saying drop the mic. And I was yeah. like, and I literally, and I didn't realize it. And I, I apologized to the, to the pastor's wife because they hadn't asked me back. <laughs> and she's like, it wasn't that big of a deal that you said it. She's like, but Kelly, it was a $10,000 mic. And oh, I was like, no. Oh, no. So, That's so sick. <laughs> so, I mean, those are things that I live for. You know what I'm saying? 
The reason why I say uh, that is because you bring your own personality uh, into every single thing that you do, Jason. Like, yeah. and I, that's what I admire. Like, you are a pastor, although you're you're Jason first, and you're you're bringing those things in. Um, so, um, and you brought that game to your wife, which recognize it, guys, because if you can roll up in a classroom like that, that is my wife's freaking hot too. So oh, she is. She's like a beautiful woman. You need to see a picture. She's a beautiful woman. So. The, I think the secret to mar- staying married is that you got to marry up, which you obviously did. If you marry up, then you'll stay grateful for the rest of your life. You know what I mean? Because you look at your wife and you'll be like, wow, you're hot, yep. and I win. Yep. So that, that, <laughs> that, that works out. So you guys go on the date. The rest is, hi- is the rest history, or do you Pretty have fast. to? Really? Dude, the, uh, this is going to freak. This would probably freak out like 99.9% of guys because I was only like 21 or something when we met. The very next day, <clears throat> uh, so we go on like a lunch date. The very next day in between class, we were talking and um, class was starting. I didn't have, back in the day, we had like briefcases. This <laughs> is <laughs> before laptops. <laughs> so you have a briefcase with your notebook. You try to look very official. With yeah, it, yeah, you know? yeah. And I didn't, I left mine in, in the car. Um, and so I had nothing to sit in front of class in front of the professor. Right. And my, my seat was like pretty close to the front. And so you look like you're not paying attention if you don't have anything to write on. So I asked Corey who I'd been on one date with, I thought I go, Hey, can I borrow just a notebook so I can sit and look like I have something? And so she just grabbed me the first notebook out of her bag or whatever. So I sit down, open it up class starts. I look down the first page is a page of her handwriting, practicing, writing her name with my last name on it. Mrs. Corey, my last name is Graves. What? I know. So you'd hey, be that's like- some stalker stuff. So you'd be like, bunny in the pot, I'm out of here, right? But for me, I was like, I'll take it. I was like, she was super hot, dude. Of course, she still is. She is. Hey, and so, all respect, all respect. No, no, Pastor, yeah, she's really Pastor Graves, all respect, but your yeah, wife is hot. She's super hot. I couldn't say that if my wife wasn't hot. And right? I was like, dude, somebody like that wants to practice my last name, I'm in. Let's let's get this thing. Wow. Yeah. yeah, we got engaged like ten months later and got How married. long after this was when you rolled in gangster style and was like, <laughs> yo, out of class now. How long no, no, that was the day yeah. that was no like three days before. I three days class, before. So I pulled out of class. We went on, on on that was like a Friday. The next Monday we had lunch and then the Tuesday was when so I'd known her for five days and she was practicing. Here's the thing, bro. A lot of women I found out do that. They just don't accidentally show it to the guy that they started dating. It's con- like women. This is calm. What do we think of like, I wonder what she looks at without her clothes on. Like, I wonder how shopping, you know? <laughs> but women, what have they been dreaming about <laughs> since they were little? They've been dreaming about getting married. Oh so a lot, not all of them, but some do, yeah. you know. My certainly. wife wasn't. My wife told me that it she was did. never going to get married. Right. So, you, you know, but different people. But for my wife, like, I don't know. It doesn't mean she knew she wanted to marry me. It was just like, but I don't know, but there's like 50 signatures, bro. Wow. A lot of practicing. I was like, that is gangster. Man, I wish I would have saved that. Because I love you don't telling have that it? story. You don't have it? No, it's just in my mind. But I love telling okay. that story to the church because it's like everyone sees my wife and like, dude, you married up. I'm like, yeah, but you know. She was she had gains. She was in. Wow. Yeah. That's no joke, man. <laughs> so when she when she signs on, <laughs> literally, guys. So, so she signs on. Yeah. You guys, young couple, you're a pastor, stuff like that. So, um, I mean, was it smooth sailing from that that point? And not, no, I'm not oh, just talking about for you guys in general. No, no, I'm not talking oh. about just marriage, but I'm just talking about like you're a young pastor, mm-hmm. right? Do you find a church right away? Are you the head of oh, the church? Oh, like what's and, the path? Yeah. No, so so at that when I met her, I was working at this big mega church in LA as like the fifth and sixth grade youth pastor kind of guy okay and then she and i both moved to ventura after that got it and i was like the assistant pastor at a small you know it's just kind of like any other business or yeah, yeah. you know you just kind of work your way through okay yeah so what is the what's the blind spots that the public has about the church because a lot of times like when you're doing what you're doing um you know uh, there's there's what a person perceives or sees. And then, you know, I was just talking with Megan Olivia, who's the mm-hmm. correspondent for the is. UFC. Yeah. So I was just talking with her and I was like, tell us about it. And what she was saying was, is the, the guys that are there are absolutely phenomenal guys. They're incredible guys that need to promote a fight. And what you guys see is them promoting and selling the fight. What I see is incredible human beings who are in, included in their communities, things like that. Mm-hmm. What are some of the blind spots that a person doesn't realize about what it is that you do? I think some people want to put pastors into this 
like pedestal that like they float two inches off the ground. They have some mysterious connection with God or like they're all just dudes. Like mm-hmm. all of them are. Some of them unfortunately play into it a little bit and try okay. and act like they're at a different level or something. But people are people. A okay. man or woman is still just a human being. Yeah. I don't have any kind of special connection with God or anything else and anybody else. Like yeah. you're just normal. So um, I think a lot of people think that like pastors, you know, wake up at four in the morning and play the harp and light the candle and listen to Michael W. Smith or some stupid thing like that, you know, and it's like, oh, I get bored praying just like anybody else, you know, I, you know, so I think that's the one thing. And, and the other thing I would say is this, sometimes it's not so much recently, but certainly when I grew up, you and I grew up at a time where there was like famous TV preachers who were taking money, oh, yeah. sleeping with their secretaries and all this nonsense. And, and I think what happens, a lot of people thought like, oh, pastors are crooks. And dude, by the way, some of them are. Okay. But very few. Almost every, and I know a ton of pastors, they get into it for the right reasons. Like they, they, the reason, a lot of pastors are bivocational. They work a job full time and then they go preach on Sundays or whatever. And, yeah. and a lot of, like almost every pastor I've ever met, like is in it to help other people. They're not in it for themselves. They're not in it for like, any kind of celebrity or fame, and they're certainly not in it to take money from anybody. Most of these guys can make a lot more money in all other kinds of ways. So um, those are the two things. A, a pastor is not someone better than you who's like a, you know, some holy man who blah, 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 but nor is he just some crook. Most guys that I know are pastors are just normal dudes who just, they live like you and me. You know? Yeah. So how about when, like, tell us about a time where God had told you to do something, you heard it, you were like, okay, and then you didn't do it. <laughs> oh, Let's tell one where like something good happened instead. No, we want to hear way that. better. <laughs> Shoot, dude, I don't know. I mean, honestly, I, like, just like you, um, I, I have. First of all, you have to say, do you believe that there's a God who who like communicates with us? And I do, yeah, yeah. but I also believe a lot of people say they God told me, and it's like. They're just nut jobs or, you know, or they're speaking like, the language for or, you. Yeah. yeah or it's yeah. like, God tends to tell you things that sound like a lot like you want, you know, God <laughs> told me to tell you to give me your money. Um, so, you know, it's all, it's little things, dude. It's little things. But sometimes I will get a very kind of like, I, this is one that happened. So my wife got breast cancer a couple of years okay. ago and um, it floored me because the kind of cancer she got is um, very high risk. We caught it early, but it's very high risk. And early on in the process, we didn't know how severe, what the turn, you know, how things were going to go. So I, um, there's a little trail near my house where I go, <clears throat> I go running, and I go there alone with my dog. Almost never see anybody on it. It's not like a nice maintained trail that's known around here. It's just this little like nobody's there. And um, one day I'm running down there. This was like a couple of days after I found out that my wife had cancer, and I had the same fears that everyone else does gonna die you know my kids are gonna get left alone you know all this kind of stuff and as i'm running on the trail i pass this young dude who's probably i don't know 21 22 years old granted i'm a a 44 year old man with my shirt off in in you embarrassingly wear, short running shorts. Do right? you wear Jenners? I mean, you wear some Bruce Jenners or what? Not pretty close. Yeah. You're, you're yeah. Guys, so, because no one's seeing me anyways. Right. So, so you see you though. <laughs> and my dog, <laughs> um, but I'm sweaty and I'm, I'm pasty. Like I'm not like, I, anyways, it's not a good look. So I run by this guy and, and as clear as like anything, I just get this thought in my head. Um, I want you to go. And what, what, what was this? He said, I want you to go and pray for that guy. I don't even know if this guy believes there's a God, but I know in my heart that that's what God wants me to do. So I ignore it, right? Because who wants to be the, it's so creepy you, on a yeah, trail. Yeah, Some 20 year old kid, I got my shirt off, all yeah. sweaty, like, hey, I gotta but, pray for you. Yeah. But you didn't mention, you need to add in that you had the really short shorts. And I had the really short shorts. I mean, shorts. I did, yeah, yeah. Were you talking, are you talking four fingers above your knee? I think they or are the, eight. They are the short, like they measure running shorts and like, I think they're five inches, seven inches. They're the I've five inches. Heard. Yeah, yeah. They you do. go five. If no. there's a seven, you ain't going to I have seven. sevens. I have nine. Why you go five? Five is, I mean. I have like two pairs that are that short. I was wearing them that day. I don't know. They feel good. You should try them. They don't look good, but they feel good. So I'm embarrassed to go talk to this guy for okay. multiple reasons. Besides the short shorts. Okay. Like right. going to a stranger and saying, 
Can I pray for you? You got tall socks on at the time. You got short socks. <laughs> Don't worry about that. <laughs> <laughs> you got you got ankle socks, or did you did you use the the I no, wear, the I no wear, shows? I only wear ankle socks. Do you do yeah. the no shows? No, or? no, no. Because okay. dirt gets in there. I you want to? I run on trails. Okay, but I don't go all the way up the calf. Okay, <laughs> this is gripping stuff. <laughs> so, anyways, I run past this guy, and basically, I tell God no. <laughs> you know, like I'm not going to do that. I just start thinking about something else. I don't want to do it. So then, a few minutes later. Um, I'm like, I just can't fight it. There's just this tug in my heart. Like, you need to go obey God. It's a small thing, but you need to go do what I told you to do. And I'm like, look, my wife's got cancer. I'm having this battle in my head. My wife's got cancer. I'm just trying to de-stress out here. I'm like not feeling good. So I come running back because it's an out and back run. So on my way back, I pass by him a second time. And as I'm coming up, I'm like, I got to freaking do it. I know I got to do it. Shoot. So I'm like, what am I going to say to this guy? So I'm like, all right, I'll just go up there and I'll just tell him, hey, I'm a pastor here in Carlsbad. I don't know if you believe in God, but, you know. So I get up to him, and right when he turns around, I, like, chicken out. Because when I walk up to him, he looks at me like, why are you coming near me? You know, who are you? We're, dude, we're in the middle of nowhere. Like, why are you coming up to me? And so I just go, hey, are you okay? And he goes, yeah, I'm fine. <laughs> like, I expect him to be like, no, pray for me. Or something. <laughs> He's like, yeah, I'm fine. Like, he gave me this weird look. Yeah, he did. So then I tried to do, like, the Jedi mind trick. I'm like, yes, but are you okay <laughs> you know and it freaked oh him out God. he was like Ugh. i'm glad the tiger king wasn't out oh, at this time because you're a straight joe exotic dude in the short shorts you're like hey i got tigers at the house want to come by want to hang out <laughs> okay so except for the bullet okay so, so i i anyways he goes i'm fine so i go good i obeyed god i talked to this guy i took off running so i run i'm like 50 steps away and god said i swear dude and i don't hear god clearly like this all the time God said, I didn't tell you to ask if he was okay. I told you to pray with him. It's like, son of a... I got to go back a third time because I've run by him. I've run back. And it's so... Yeah. So, But but by this time, dude, it, I don't know how to explain it. But like, I knew this was like, you do this. You know, like, I knew I had to do this. Yeah. I can't explain why. So I run back. We get up to him and I go, hey. I go, I don't want to freak you out. I know this is going to sound weird. I said, but I'm, I'm a pastor. Let's first, like, there's a reason why I'm going to ask you what I'm going to ask you. I'm a pastor here in Carlsbad. I'm a Christian. And, um, and right when I was about to say the next thing, he goes, oh, I'm a Christian too. I was like, oh, thank God. Because yes. if, if it's an atheist, it's a different, it's a different conversation. Different one. <laughs> Can I pray for you to a God you, that you do not acknowledge? Right. So I, I, he, I go, hey, I go, this might sound weird, but I felt like when I was running by you that... God wanted me to ask you if I could pray for you about something. Now, remember, this is a couple days after my wife gets wow. diagnosed with cancer, right? So I'm very fragile. I, I might have even been crying on that run. Like, it was, I, was, I was in a gnarly place. And right when I ask him, he looks at me. He goes, well, my mom just got diagnosed with breast cancer yesterday. Oh. And, dude, I just started crying. Because what I realized is it wasn't so much that God wanted me to pray for him for him, but for God to remind me that he's paying attention to, like he's involved in this mysterious, nobody knows the outcome of cancer. Like it could be anything. And what it was, it was like God telling me, when you obey me and listen to me, I was telling you to go pray for this guy, not just for him, but so that you would know that I'm involved. And so by praying with this guy, it was like, yes, I prayed for him and his mom, but it was God saying to me, like, I'm in, I'm in the middle of this stuff. Like I'm involved even when there's cancer. Wow. Yeah. So I prayed for him like 12 seconds, like, God, pray for you, pray for And then I just took off. And I was like, God, thanks for, thanks for making me do this. Because like, what are the chances? First of all, I never see people on this trail. I see yeah. more coyotes than humans. Yeah. And that the kid that I walk by, God tells me to pray for him. I pray for him. And his, his mom got diagnosed like the same day my wife got diagnosed with breast cancer. Wow. Yeah. Well, I think the thing that's the most amazing is that you were more fearful to actually do your job than, <laughs> you know what I mean? Because you're, like, you're a actually, pastor. You're, I'm like, actually disappointed you know in you I mean? right now. Like, because you're a, you're a pastor, that's what you do is pray for people, but you'll roll up in somebody's classroom <laughs> and just she'll look at a woman and be like, yo, come outside, baby. In one day, you're going to be writing my name. You know what I mean? Like, I, I just think, I think it's awesome. Yeah. I think it's amazing. What message do you want to send out? Like... <clears throat> 
you know, I heard you speak about, uh, you know, as we were talking today and you were uh, talking about like you wanted to be able to connect with kids and a little side note. And I told you this the first time I met you. Well, I told you a couple of things. First, I was I told you I was going to force you to be my friend. OK, for the rest of your life. <laughs> so you can't get you can't get rid of me. Um, second thing was, is I used to go to a church called Church of God in Lompoc. Phenomenal uh, pastor. His name was Pastor Field. But it was the first uh, church we ever went to. And. We had never gone to church. Fourth grade, my dad finds Jesus. Well, he wasn't lost, but my dad found him somehow. <laughs> and he goes to, you know, three services on Saturday, Sunday and, and Wednesday and changes the dog's name from Bandit to Elijah because he says it will have a bad spirit by having that name. Like, oh, this is how deep my dad goes Christian. in. Super Christian. So. Shiite Christian. <laughs> we start going to this other church, Foursquare Church. Because our friends were like, yo, why don't you come hang with us? It's cool. There's this cool uh, kids program, whatever it is. We go to it. My dad's pastor pulls him in the office and is like, yo, I hear that your kids are going to another church. And my dad was like, uh, yes. And he, he paused and then he said, I think you should move churches because if your kids want to go there, that's where you should go. Well, fast forward three, four years ago. Uh, probably three years ago now. Um, we were on the way to uh, my home church before. And my daughter was like, Daddy, can we go to Daybreak? And I said, no, we're already set up. There's like 13 of us going. And my dad had that conversation. He said, he told me that story. And he said, wherever your kids want to go should be. And I, I went. And I've I, given that advice many times. And I told you that story. And you were like, wait a second. Who's the pastor that from the Foursquare? And I said, Bernie Fetterman. Well, Bernie Fetterman... Mm -hmm. was a guy that you were connected with. And if I'm correct on this, unless you were just telling some story to me uh, outside, you weren't wearing short shorts uh, and no shirt, <laughs> but that uh, Bernie had an in, uh, um, influence on you moving here to Carlsbad. Not only that, it's a quote that I've probably quoted more than any other quote in my entire life. It wasn't from him. I didn't know it. It's from a guy named John Shedd. And the quote is this, ships are safe in the harbor, but that is not what ships are built for. And he gave me that advice when I was in Ventura and we were going to move to San Diego to start a new church. We had no money in the bank. We didn't have any people. It was like, for us, it would be like just, you know, starting a new business somewhere, yeah. right? It's like going and being a startup. And Bernie gave me, uh, I don't remember if it was on a piece of paper. I think it was a little piece of paper, but he, he had known me since I was a kid. And, and um, he, you know, we were just weighing out like, this is is this crazy? Should we do this? And he gave me that quote. And wow. that was literally like a tipping point. Like, yeah, we're going to go move and we're going to move our family. We're going to start everything over wow. and we're going to bet on like an adventure instead of just doing what's safe. <clears throat> I love that quote. Well, it's amazing because you said that you moved here 20 years ago and yep. how God has a, a plan where my daughter now is 11 years old. My daughter asked me every single week, not, can I go see my friends? Not, can I do those things? Can I, are we going to church daddy? And I, caught her the other day with her Alexa. She was going up to take a shower, 11, and she had on uh, contemporary Christian music, That's cool. praise music. And so I want to thank you because, you know, being obedient to God, obviously you're not when you're running. Um, so you take that time <laughs> off. So if I you was. See, it just took me three times. <laughs> so if you see Pastor Jason running or anything like that, you won't, don't, yeah. you won't see me. Yeah, don't, yeah. you don't want to see those five inchers. You don't want to see those five inch shorts. Uh, you know what I mean? We need to keep them under wraps. We need to keep them definitely under wraps. <laughs> but I, I love what you're talking about with the, uh, with, you know, building men, like truly building men, because there's not many people, probably one of my best or my favorite authors of all time is Edwin Lewis Cole. Mm -hmm. And that is Dr. Cole. And he talked about this men's part of it where it was building men to be able to serve, yes. not building men to, to over rule over. Yes. hundred percent. Help me with this. Yeah. So uh, it, it, on occasion, people from the outside who know me and know my work will be like, Oh, you know, you focus too much on men. Blah, blah. I've never had a woman, a wife, a daughter, sister, whatever, complain once I like kind of helped influence their husband. Because what we influence men to do is what I believe God wired us to do. And that is to serve the people that we love, to protect them, to look out for them, to build them up. And so the whole like old school idea that people have, like that Christians are all about suppressing women. It, dude, Jesus was such a rule breaker for women's rights, that if you read the Gospels and look, like he was consistently um, building women in a time, by the way, where like women 
were considered not God didn't consider women this way, but the culture uh, of that you read about in Bible times treated women like property or dogs. Like literally, there were sayings about how women, women and Gentiles were the equivalent of a dog. I mean, just ridiculous, horrible. Honestly, it's the stuff that you still see about in certain parts of the world where mm-hmm. women are treated as property and stuff, right? And so when you when you understand the the depth of, of first of all that God since the beginning of creation was we are all created in God's image. Every human being, it doesn't matter what religion you are, doesn't matter how much money you have, the color of your skin, where you're born, every human being is made in the image of God and has immense value, right? And so um, for me, I found that as oftentimes a dad or a husband goes, so the family goes, right? What they, what, if the dad is not strong in, in loving and serving um, his his wife and family well. The way I often say it is this, sadly, you know, a lot of guys want to have guns next to their bed, right, in case a bad guy breaks in. Yeah. But really, a, a, a family, a wife, kids, grandkids, are far more likely to be to suffer from something that their own dad or husband does in making a poor choice. You know, a dad gets addicted, a dad neglects, a dad for, you know, all the crap that you and I as men know are constantly pulling for us, pulling at our, our lives that will end up having a negative effect. And so what my job is to try and help men be servant-hearted leaders and protectors of the people that God has entrusted in them, whether they're leading a business, right, and they're looking out for their employees, or whether they are, uh, you know, looking out for their wife or for their kids, or in my world, in the church world. But there's this, this recognition that as a man, I am to lay my life down. There's a Bible verse that says that men are supposed to lay their life down for their wife the way that Christ... Jesus laid his life down for us. And, and if you know anything about the Bible, it didn't turn out good for Jesus. They <laughs> killed him. And so that's the idea. Get up, look yourself in the mirror every day as a man and go like, you got to die today, dude, to make sure that your wife becomes all that she's supposed to be and that your kids have a great family life and they have a great dad and all that kind of stuff. So that's, that's the passion behind my emphasis on men because if you come to daybreak you know like there aren't really any flowers around there it's awesome it's not a very like churchy kind of environment no it's more like we're talking about ufc i have yet to say sexual chocolate from the stage but that's the same philosophy i am available i am available (laughs) i promise i won't drop your mic um so you know as we as we close here uh jason what do you want the people to know besides the fact that um you're a michael jackson fan um, you beat women up. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you could beat up both your brothers. I run. Uh, I run basically naked. Yes, you run uh, naked. Um, you hide chains and knives <laughs> in, in the bushes. Um, that you roll in and interrupt colleges to be able to go after a woman who then signs your name like two days later. One woman. One woman. Not women. No. Okay. One, One woman. woman. I love this. I love this. Uh, that you do that. You got uh, gangster ways. Um, what 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 message do you want to send out there to the world? Oh man, that's a deep one, dude. I didn't know you were going to ask me that. Um, you want me to ask you like what uh, what's your favorite pizza? You know what I mean? No, no. I mean, <laughs> I'm I'm just, just, one I'm just message. Kidding. I get one message. What if, what if you had? What if you had? Okay, let's do it like this. I'm a pastor, so when people say one message, it's going to be about God. Okay. So, because um, to me, that's the most important thing. Yeah. And what I would say, is it okay if it's about that? I think it's what okay. I would, what I would say is this. Um, God has a plan for every human being, and it's far better than the best dream of your plan for your life. And so that's, that's something that was instilled in me as a young person, and I still to this day wrestle with, right? Because I always wanted, like, I know better than God. God, what you have for me is not going to be as much fun. It's not going to be as thrilling. It's not going to be as adventurous. And the reality is there's a Bible verse that says this, that God won't withhold anything that is good from those who, who fear him or seek him or, or live for him. And I really believe that. Like the best version of your life, the best version of my life is first recognizing there is a God and then moving from, I believe there's a God out there to actually like, I'm going to recognize that he's my God. And that's a big personal decision. But I believe once you do that, you open yourself up to a life that's far better than what you think the best version of your life can be. It may not have as many like multicolored Porsches and Teslas in it, but <laughs> but in the end, that's a hunk of metal and that brings no joy. 
That's true. Very little joy <clears throat> in the long run. I mean, it's fun for a first few days. Absolutely. But I found in life, like the stuff, what, we're learning this right now during this. I don't know if this podcast is going to come out during anytime soon, but we're in this whole stay at home thing, right? What are we learning? Like simple things, yeah. cooking a meal with the family, like nobody's out like buying big stuff or like it, it, we're finding out like what's really important in life. And for me, the message that I often try to, to give to people is you don't have to be afraid that to, 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 put God in first place in your life means that you have to say no to all the stuff that would really be fun. Cause isn't that the idea? Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh man, you don't get to do this. You don't get to do that. You get that, you know, but when you think more deeply about it, a lot of the stuff that we kind of accept as what the epitome, like for me, again, growing up in California, LA, the epitome is like, could you be a celebrity? Could you have all these things? Right. Yeah. And we all know by looking at celebrities, they tend to have the healthiest relationships the most deep joy in their life, the <laughs> least amount of anxiety, tri you know what I mean, right? Yeah. And so there's a reason for that. And a lot of us just don't think deeply enough about it that oftentimes the, the more simple things in life, and, and I really believe that that's what God often draws us to. Yeah, you may not have all of the things that the world says is gonna be the best way to live your life, but you and I both know deep down because we have something in common, and that is we know that when we put God first in our life, that he takes care of all the other stuff in ways that will blow blow our minds. He'll take a kid who beats up girls and listens to NWA, <laughs> <laughs> and he lets him live in Carl's bed by the beach. That's my that's my, my cho sexual chocolate. <laughs> there we go. So Jason, how can they get a hold of you? Uh, you know, I know you're not a you're not a huge Instagrammer, and I loved because I texted you yeah yesterday, and you said uh, how can I prep for this? And I was like, you you can't prep for this, um, but how can I prep for this? And I was like, wear a Titans jersey, and <laughs> you were like, nope. two hours later, I love the realness. Two hours later, I. Get get a, a message from you and you said this is me ignoring the last text <laughs> <laughs> just so, in case you didn't know so how can they get a hold of you like i'm sure that uh every listener out there if you're you're out there i mean you hear the heart of this guy i mean he's incredible and he's this guy all the time which is amazing um you know so how can they get a hold of you how can they hear you know what channels can can someone get in touch? I would just, they, uh, daybreakchurch.org is our church's website. That's where my messages are. I'm not trying to like get people in touch with me. No. Because thankfully I don't have to sell anything. Good. Um, <laughs> but uh, daybreakchurch.org, um, I am on Instagram, uh, Jason Graves. And um, and you're going to see a lot of adventure stuff on there, which is great. Yeah. I like that stuff. I don't use it the way, like thankfully, I don't I don't have to leverage social media. I understand. To do anything. Yeah. It's just like for my friends and family to see what I've been doing in my life. I have. I, do you have the five inches on there? <laughs> You'll notice, bro. Okay. If I'm, it's running, always up. You, uh, you notice it's that? Always yeah. up top. That's okay. the rule I made with my wife. Okay. Uh, yeah. I'm gonna see if I can get you sponsored. So Under Armour <laughs> out there, or uh, or Nike. My brother actually just signed a, a contract for one of his clients with Nike. Um, so if you are in the short short market, um, <laughs> we have <laughs> a man that is here for you. So I want to thank you seriously so much for your time. And the thing that I'm gonna ask you for. Well, I think there's one last pressing question, sure. and it, but it's, it's a little on the deeper side. Okay. And that is, um, have you thought about, you know, through this COVID time and through the times, things like that, where you got a chance to be able to spend time with your family, have you th really considered what veneers would do for your life? <laughs> I thought it was going to be out the Oakland Raiders. <laughs> I thought I was the <laughs> I'm joking with you, but I, the the Oakland Raiders is a whole nother story. I'm joking with you, but um, you know I think that there's stereotypes, and I have them in my business too. You know, as we as we go along, there's stereotypes of like you know I, I got stereotypes. What are the, the stereotypes hair. for pastors? Stereotypes with the pastors is um, uh, really shiny suits. Um, so shiny suits, uh, at least two or three gold chains. Um, that, that we have, I've never seen these before, um, strong veneers. I'm not talking about, I'm, I'm down with veneers, like good looking veneers. My, my, uh, my friend is a, is one of the top cosmetic dentists in the yeah. country. Uh, his name is shout out to Eric Compton, uh, Compton Broomhead, uh, uh, dental, but I'm talking, you know what I'm talking about? Them yeah. chiclets, those big, huge, like, arr. like Ross from friends. Yes. yes. Those bad boys. I would say, um, I think that, I mean. I think that would be the the ones. <laughs> I own one suit. Okay. You have to be. I've never you seen have you, to have, you have to have died. Yeah. Or be getting married. Good. In order to see me in it. I love it. <laughs> Only at a wedding or a funeral. <laughs> <laughs> well, and the, no, this, on the serious note, I, I always, uh, I want to uh, ask you before you leave, which is number one, will you be my friend? 
Um, number two is I want to do a, a sequel. Um, so I want to have you here again because I think that your information and, and not only the information but your heart, I believe that the world needs it. I think that they need to hear it. I think more and more uh, men need to hear it. I think that women need to hear it. Although when I read Ed Lewis Cole for the first time, um, I didn't want any woman in my life to read it. Sure. Because then they would have a They would know it. about you. Does that make sense? <laughs> so, but I, I, I truly, I want to thank you for your time. You have You're been welcome. amazing. Absolutely phenomenal. So cool. uh, subscribe, uh, comment, do all those things that you're supposed to do. Um, but uh, thank you so much for being on the podcast, Jason. My pleasure. You like Chick-fil-A. <laughs>